let's uh, continue on. Let's jump into chapter nine. Let's see how far we can get. I think we will, let's see, we've got, what, an hour? And I think we'll uh, do a significant chunk, if not all of chapter nine. Maybe not get a chance to do any examples and I'll debate when we come back if we should do some more examples or maybe I'll cover them over the weekend with a bunch of videos and saying, okay, why don't I just jump right into the solutions of the problems here. But let's talk about this chapter. Because the last two chapters were introducing you to the conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. So in my mind, I kind of put those together. They have the same kind of tools. Uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit more. So you can see we're learning a little more physics here. And the start of this chapter, in fact, maybe I should have just put the title. I'll just write it on the board. The title of this chapter is about called Statics, which then you can't really talk about statics unless you also talk about torque. And so here, this word torque is going to be something new to you guys, a new quantity. And you'll, you'll see why. Now, the easiest way, I think, to look at statics is to say when something is static, uh, for example, this stapler on the desk, is static. And what I mean by that, it's not moving, but I also mean it's not moving a second from now. So it's stable, or I should say its velocity is zero, and a moment later its velocity is still zero. You might even remember from the test, I gave you a, a multiple choice problem, and it was throwing the ball up. And it says at the very top, what is its and you can ask it either way. You could say, what is its acceleration or what is its speed? I, I asked on the test, what is its acceleration? Many people answered zero for their speed. Easy mistake to do because it's that subtlety of mixing up what is speed and what is acceleration. And so I'm going to say that if something is static, what I mean is its velocity is zero, but not just at that moment. A ball thrown up in the air and at the top when its speed is zero, I would not call that static. What I would call something static is if both conditions there are true. That is, not only does it have zero speed, but it has zero acceleration. Because zero acceleration is really the most important part. Zero acceleration means that it will not change its speed. And so if it had zero a moment later, it still has zero. And so this right here, remember the sum of all the forces equal the net force which equal mass times acceleration. And so if something is static, this is the requirement, right? All the forces have to add up to zero. Now, let me also put arrowheads over this because to be static, I would imply that it's acceleration in the x and the y and the z have to be zero, right? When an engineer builds a bridge, they want that bridge to not move x, y, <laughs> or z. And so we want that bridge in what we would say static equilibrium. Now, it gets a little more complex, but I'll start with then this kind of this first picture that your author has. It's picture two and picture three. Your author just says, here is a person who is static. Here is a person, it looks like they're standing in the front of something. So here I am standing on the stage. And here's what we know. By looking at the picture, we know zero acceleration which means all the forces add up to be zero. And in the case of the person, it's pretty easy. There's just two forces, gravity and everything touching him, which is just the floor. 
So we've got the weight pulling the person down, and we've got the floor, which we call a normal force, pushing up. Those must then be equal. So in this case, normal force equals weight. Remember we said it doesn't always, but often it does. This would be a case where normal force equals the weight. So the net force on that individual would be zero. Left or right, there's really nothing to talk about, but there's nothing left and nothing right. So the net force left and right is zero. Net force up and down is zero. You might even say net force forward and back is zero. This person's in equilibrium. Now, <clears throat> car, here's the same thing. Although here, uh, you might not call it a static equilibrium, you might call it more of a dynamic equilibrium because they're saying, what if the car was moving along at a constant speed? Well, the constant speed would still mean the acceleration is zero. It doesn't mean the velocity is zero, that's why I would probably call it more of a dynamic equilibrium than a static equilibrium. So it's a little bit out of place for what your author is talking about. But notice what the author has done in this diagram. He's put the free body diagram over here and he's saying, take a look at these. You have the weight of the car pulling down and you've got four normal forces on each tire. And they're probably not equal, but for simplicity, the author says, let's just call them equal. And so the author is saying right here, if you take the sum of these upward forces, they must equal the downward force. So the sum of the four normal forces equal the weight down. That way we come out to be zero acceleration. Left and right, the same thing. Uh, they're saying that there is some applied force. It's probably the traction of the tires, which of course the tires are being pushed by the engine, but the car is being pushed by the friction between the tires and the road. And so the car gets pushed, in this case it would be to your right, but maybe there is something opposing the car. Maybe it's just air resistance. And if those two are then equal, as he shows, you would have zero acceleration left and right, and so we would call this a static case, or really more a dynamic equilibrium case, because we're moving at a constant speed. So like I said, I don't think that first one is really too surprising. Here's where it gets a little beyond where we've already done. See, I would say that much we've already done. But when it comes to something that is static, I would say that not only do we want its velocity to be zero, its translational or linear velocity to be zero, but we also want its rotational velocity to be zero. I mean, again, think about a bridge for a moment. If the designed by the engineers is to build a bridge so you know people can drive on and off you want it to be in what we'll call static equilibrium so we don't want the bridge to move but we also don't want the bridge to spin and so what I mean by that is let's kind of go back to the center of mass remember this this hammer I was saying and so we're going to start focusing a little more attention on our objects having size to them and dimensions to them. And so in this case, this little marker right here is supposed to represent what we call the center of gravity of it. Uh, where some of the mass is over here to the right and some of it is to the left. Of course, as you'll see, I've got more mass at a shorter distance to the left and a less mass but longer distance over here to the right. And as we continue to talk, we'll see how those balance out each other. But the whole net effect is we will say this point, this magical point, this center of gravity is where all this mass is equivalent to. Uh, I was talking about it two chapters ago in terms of gravitation, and so if I said I lifted it up and calculated its gravitational potential energy, when I went to go for its height, you would ask this question, well, is it to the height of the bottom of the hammer? Is it the height to the top of the hammer? Mm, center of mass. So not the center of the hammer, not the top of the hammer, not the bottom of the hammer, but this magical point. 
And once we start talking about torques here, you'll be see how we can kind of justify this magical point isn't necessarily in the middle of the object. It's a balancing act between a lot of mass and a lot of distance. Now, you see it with this one too that I pointed out. If I were to hold this up in the air and I kind of modeled this as a person and I was saying, okay, if I want to know the gravitational potential energy of this person, do I measure the height to their feet? Do I measure the height to their head? Do I measure the height to the middle of their body? No, it's to the center of mass. And so there's this magical point. And we just kind of vaguely give a definition of it, trying to kind of give you a gut feeling for it. But now we'll go be able to go a little further when we get into this whole idea of, of, of torque here. But what I'm trying to get at is if I want this object to be stationary, that means I would want the downward forces, its weight, equal the upward forces. So in this case, it's tension. But also, even if they're equal, I don't want it to spin. And so this is the new piece we've needed to spend some time on. We, we talked a little bit about things spinning and rotating. That's why we had angular speed. But now we need to take a deeper dive into it, this chapter, and particularly the next chapter. And so I'm going to say, for this chapter anyways, if I want something to be static, I want A, the velocity to be zero with an acceleration of zero, and then B, I want the angular speed to be zero with also the change in angular speed per time to be zero. Uh, this is kind of similar to this. Uh, your author doesn't use the word angular acceleration until the next chapter, but let me go ahead and do that now. This would be an angular acceleration. In other words, we want this thing to have zero translational acceleration and zero angular acceleration. We want it to not translate and not rotate. And so these are the two conditions. And let's spend a little time about making things rotate. This is going to lead to this idea of, of torque. In fact, your author says there are two conditions for equilibrium. And he calls this one right here the first condition. And this is where we are going to have a longer discussion about things rotating, which we will get into what we call the second condition. Because we've done a lot of this. We've done a lot of translational motion. Now, now we're shifting gears a little bit. These next couple of chapters are, let's talk about things that rotate. Or in this case, don't rotate. But what causes them to rotate. All right, well, imagine this for a moment. Maybe I'll take something kind of long like a little stick here, and I'll grab my little stick. And let's say that I mount it right up here with some kind of bolt or screw or nut, okay? So I'm just going to stick it in here. And so it's heading out here. And I go to rotate it. Uh, maybe I kind of reach my hand up here and I grab it and I say, I'm going to pull with a force of F. So notice I didn't grab it at the end. I, I grabbed it somewhere, not even in the middle, just some weird spot, if you will. And I want to talk about this force that makes it rotate because there's a lot more going on than just force and that's really what we want to get at. We want to get at this idea of what is a torque and I want to emphasize then torque is something more than force. I mean clearly to get it to rotate I have to apply a force to it. But maybe you can imagine this for a moment. Let's say over here somebody was opposing me Maybe a break. 
and they're pushing at a further distance away. What I'm trying to get you to see is if I were to pull this and it would now rotate to here. And so it goes from here to here. See how the point where my hand is would rotate like this? It'd rotate along an arc. Uh, maybe I'll call this arc S1. But over here, this opposing force would rotate with an arc of S2. Can you see how further out would be a bigger distance on the arc than closer in? Do, do you see that that arc is kind of related to the radius of the turn? So I'll call R1 the distance from the pivot to where my hand is. Because if I go the pivot to where this stopping force is, I'll call that R2. Let's go back a couple chapters to energy. I would say that if we look at the energy, force times distance, so I've got a force here and a distance here, for somebody to oppose it, or maybe for somebody to do the same thing I did, but at a bigger distance, do you see how their force could be less because the distance is more? What I'm trying to get at here is to get to something to rotate implies, yes, you need a force, but I want to argue that it also depends on how much distance you are from your pivot point. And so it's both those factors, not just force, but also distance. You can see this in a couple of simple experiments. Let me come over here. The easiest one is this door. Now, uh, this door is locked, so let me kind of jam something in there so the door doesn't close all the way. Oh, you think it'll unlock if I do that? No. Uh, no. But anyways, I wanted a jar here so I don't have to actually push this anyways. But I bet a lot of you, just because you've lived 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 years, you know how to open a door. You, you walk up to the door and assuming it's unlocked or partly propped open here, where do you push on the door? Now let me pause for a moment. Are you trying to translate the door or rotate the door? Ah, uh, you're trying to rotate it. And that's what I want to get at. See, if I wanted to push something, I would have think about a force. But now I want to kind of introduce you to this idea of torque. Torque is something you apply to make something rotate. Force is something you apply to make it translate. And so we're going to have this whole idea of what does it take to make something rotate as opposed to translate. And I want to convince you that to get something to rotate, sure, you need a force, but that's only part of it. And this is my way of saying torque is more than just force. So again, it's not just semantics, but I'll start with semantics. If I walk up to this door, I would say I want to rotate the door. Therefore, to open the door, I need to give it a torque, not a force. Now, I will admit that force is part of torque. So it sounds kind of funny when I say, oh, I don't need to give it a force. I need to give it a torque. It's like, oh, you don't have to give it any force? No, no, no. What I'm saying is I need to give it something more complex than just a force. I have to give it a torque. All right. So I walk up to this door. And if I'm just educated in semantics, I would say, okay, I want to apply a torque to the door. But the reason I picked the door is because I think you guys are experienced. Most people walk up to a door and they push it where? On the outside of the door, not near the hinge. They push it far from the hinge. 
Why? Well, hopefully back to this picture, right? In order to open the door, to give it the energy, you need a force and distance. See how over here you have more distance so you can need less force. If you pushed it over here, you would have to give it a more force because of the shorter distance. Maybe you've even accidentally done that. Maybe you've walked up to a door. I've seen people walking to a door and they're not sure which side the hinge is on. And they get the wrong side and they push here. See, when you push here, it's real easy to open the door. When you push here, it's hard to open the door. I can still open it. And I'm going to say here, it requires the same amount of torque to open the door. But torque is a combination of the force and where I apply that a force. How far away is it? And so I'm going to put up here that torque, which we will go ahead and use the Greek letter tau for torque. And you will start to see a pattern here. When we talk about rotations, we'll start using the Greek alphabet because our objects will now go not only translate, but now we're going to go into a new part of our mechanics and we're going to talk about things rotating. And of course, the harder ones is when they're doing both at the same time. I've got a satellite and it's translating and it's orbiting and it's spinning. <laughs> and all of those motions together make for a hard piece of physics, a hard piece of mechanical engineering. And so that's why we're starting here. Actually, I'd say we already started a little bit on rotation because we had rotational speed or angular velocity. But now we're taking a little deeper dive. What does it take to get it to rotate? And I want to say it again. To get it to rotate, you don't apply a force. You apply a torque. torque. And torque is more than force. So I'm going to say that in order to get this thing to rotate, yes, you have to apply a force. But I'm going to also multiply by the distance r. And so, again, maybe when you're leaving class here in 45 minutes, try this on the door. Push it here and see how easy it opens. Push it here <laughs> and see how much more force you have to apply. Because you can see in the math right here that if R is small, F has to be big. Of course, it's also true the other way around. If the R is big, F is small. And so most people then have learned that the way to open this door is not even to push it in the middle, but to push it on the outside of the door where the R is greater, therefore your force can be lower. Now, there's something else here that is worth examining. Let me go ahead and kind of erase this visual picture that I put here for the motion. Uh, let me come back here and say, okay, so here I am pulling on it with a force F to try to make it move. Do you see how I'm pulling it in a direction that it will not move? In other words, it moves in an arc. It doesn't really move in the direction I'm pushing it. So I'm pushing or pulling it this way. I would say that's a combination of stretching it and turning it. The stretching it might break it if it, you know, if I was strong enough. But let's assume that the material is strong enough that I don't break it. And so if I put this up here, but I pull down this way, all of my force is not used. Only a component of my force is used. Uh, again, maybe with a pitcher, I would draw it this way. Uh, 
I'll use the red here, I could say that my force is made up of a little bit along the direction of this meter stick or this rod and then perpendicular. So let's think about my force as being made up of two pieces. And it is only this piece right here, the part that is perpendicular, that actually contributes to any of the rotation. And so I would say that just by taking force times this r, this radius would be almost correct. But it's still too big. I really need to say if there is an angle here, theta, between the radius and the force, the only part that is making it twist is the component perpendicular and so that would be sine theta. And so this introduces us to torque. This is saying, what does it take to make something rotate? And I'm going to claim to make something rotate, it's a combination of three factors. The obvious one is the force. How much force do you put? But the other two I don't think are quite so obvious. The position, how far away from the pivot did you push it? And the other one, what direction did you push it? Let's see if this picture helps. Let's say that I have a bolt. In this bolt, I am going to put a wrench. And I'm going to tighten this wrench. What would make it the easiest to tighten the wrench? Starting with does the bolt want a force or a torque? Is this a translation or is this a rotation? Yeah, it's a rotation. So we're talking about torque. So, if I were to grab the wrench right here and push, <laughs> as hard as I want, <laughs> how much torque do I get? Zero. Why? It doesn't turn the bolt at all. Why not? Yeah. And I would say right here. The distance. We might call this the leverage involved. Right? I have zero distance going on. And all I'm doing is pushing on it. If, if this bolt was right here on this desk, and I grabbed it right here, I might translate the desk. I'm applying a force so it might translate, but I am not going to get that bolt to rotate. So I'd be applying a force, but no torque. So I know what you're thinking. Where, where should I grab the wrench? Okay, at the end, because right, part of torque is the bigger the distance. Okay, so I'm going to grab the wrench near the end, give a little room for my hand, and I'm going to then put a force on the wrench that way. <laughs> Is that going to turn the bolt? No, why not? You said I have to give it a force. You said I have to be far away from the bolt. But it's also the direction, right? This force, oh, like we said back here, is just the part that's stretching the wrench, if you will. Uh, this would do nothing more than take the wrench off the bolt <laughs> and translate it. It wouldn't rotate it, right? So forces make things translate. Torques make them rotate. So I think you guys are getting the idea that the best option for me 
would be to apply a force so that if I take a line from the pivot to where the force is, and then the line of the force, it's 90 degrees. Sine of 90 degrees is 1. That's the biggest it ever gets. So your best option is 90 degrees. Anything less than 90 degrees is going to give you less torque. And so let me say it again. My goal here is to kind of get you a feel for what torque is and to emphasize torque is more than force. Torques are used for rotation. And so when it comes to thinking about how much torque do I have, I wouldn't even think about the question of torque unless I was thinking about rotation. And then if I'm thinking about torque, I would go beyond just how much force. I would also include where the force is applied and in what direction is the force applied. All three of those factors contribute to the torque. Now, maybe we should talk about the units because like every chapter we have something new like last chapter we had momentum so we talked about the units of momentum and the principle of conservation of momentum before that we had the principle of conservation of energy and then the units for energy which was a joule what would the units here be for a torque well force would be in newtons and the distance would be in meters and this would have no units so we're going to use the unit a newton times a meter for a torque so that'll be our units be very careful i think we saw this before didn't we where did we see a newton times a meter we saw that for work right force times distance but remember work was the amount of force in the direction it moved. Th this distance is not the distance it moved. Uh, if we come back to our picture and we actually moved, this arc length S would be its distance. And I think because work has force and distance and torque has force and distance, it's easy for the beginning student to confuse those two. Well, aren't they the same? Aren't they both force and distances? Yeah, but they're different distances. So do the units come out to be the same? Well, yeah, but let's do this. Let's never call this a joule. Because if I start calling it a joule, it might come across as energy. So both of them involve force. Both of them involve distance. Let's reserve the word joule for energy. And if it's torque, we'll just leave it as a newton times a meter. And that's how we'll distinguish it. And so, like I said, it's, it's very easy to confuse a torque with an energy because they're both in forces and they're both involving distances. But the distances are different. And so because of that, we want to kind of indicate they are different. And so that's how we'll do it. Uh, some of you may have uh, worked on different construction projects or automobiles and you're tightening up a, a head bolt or something you know and the manual says okay remove the eight bolts put them back in tighten them up and there's a certain pattern and, and you have a special wrench called a torque wrench and it'll say tighten it up to a certain and usually here in the United States will it'll say foot pounds but did you notice foot for distance pounds for force sure it's a different unit but it's the same basic idea. I know my torque wrench has a little mark on it on one side and reads in foot pounds. And on the other side of the torque wrench, it reads in Newton meters. And so depending on which car I'm working on or which manual, because my American married cars say, okay, tighten up the head bolt to, you know, 50 foot pounds. And then the, my foreign cars then give it in Newton per meter. And so I got to figure out what to set my torque wrench at to make sure I tighten my bolt up enough, but not too much. Because too much can be as bad as not enough. Obviously not enough, they're loose. But too much, you begin to pull the, the threads of the metal piece apart and then you weaken the bolt. So you want that bolt at the right torque, not the right force. Right torque. All right, so this is this fundamental idea of, of torque. And so I'll say it again, even though I've kind of erased it here. The first condition is you want all the forces to add up to zero. What do you think then 
the condition would be for not rotating. So if I had an object that is looking like this, like a meter stick, which I just happen to have coincidentally, right? A meter stick right here. And I put it on a pivot. And if I want it to be in static equilibrium, I want to make sure that downward forces equal the upward forces. So the meter stick has some weight pulling down, okay. But this little support stand is pushing up. So the net forces are zero, it doesn't translate. But I also don't want it to rotate. So I would want torques making it go counterclockwise would equal torques making it go clockwise. See, if I were to put a small little weight right over here and let it go, <laughs> I bet it doesn't surprise you that I have now just applied a torque and it rotates. And in your case, uh, let's see, where you counterclockwise. But if I were to take this one off and do the same logic over here, I would apply a torque, and again, hopefully it doesn't surprise you, it rotates clockwise. So instead of talking about forces that are left, well, right for you, right and left, we can talk about torques that are clockwise or counterclockwise. That will be our two directions. So we don't have a translational direction, we have a rotational direction. And so if I were to come over here and apply, I'll call it torque number one, and so in this picture it looks like this would make it go clockwise, and over here torque number two, so this one's making it go counterclockwise, we can pick one direction positive and one direction negative. Traditionally, and you know, just like an x-axis, traditionally to the right is positive. Traditionally, counterclockwise is positive, and clockwise is negative. You probably remember that from your trig class. You know, you've got the axis of your trig functions, and as they go counterclockwise, it's positive, and as you go clockwise, it's negative. I, I'm not saying we have to stick to that, but what I am saying is we need to pick one as positive and one as negative. And so if I were to add up all the torques, I should get zero. And so this is what your author says is condition number two. Oh, let me see if I can give it a try. This will also maybe help you understand torques a little bit better because torques are more complex than force. They involve not only forces but also distance and angles. So if I were to put this lighter weight at a big distance and the bigger weight at a shorter distance, this one weighs more than that one. Fair enough? But that doesn't necessarily mean I get a greater torque because isn't the torque the force and the distance? and then sine of 90 degrees. So I'm not really showing an angle here. And so I'm just going to slide this one out a little bit to demonstrate that if I let this, no, wasn't enough, a little more. <laughs> if I let it go, I get more torque from this one. This one wins the battle, if you will, than here. Uh, I could move it in and give it less torque and so now this one wins the battle. And so the torque here is a combination of force and distance. And if I get the distance 
and by the way these two weights are uh, a factor of two this is 100 grams and this is 50 grams so I have twice as much force over here compared to here so if I match it with twice the distance then this torque should equal that torque and right now it looks like I'm a little more than twice the distance because see how it tipped this way this this torque is is winning and I don't know if I should take too much time to show you we can get it balanced and we can get torque counterclockwise positive and torque clockwise negative to be equal and I would argue that was going on with the center of mass our center of gravity the reason this balances so well right here is because this bigger heavier object is at a shorter distance and gravity is pulling it this way and yet this one over here is being pulled this way and so I have balanced torques not balanced forces balanced torques and so I've got it distance and weight Yeah. The well, um, I, I purposely, let me, I think you're saying, what if I took the weights off for a second? Um, I purposely then set it up before class so that if I took the center mass of this half, which would be right here, and then the center mass of this half right here, they're the same distance out, the same weight, they would balance each other in terms of torque. So that way I didn't really think about the weight of the meter stick. I was just thinking about the, the weights I added. I think what you're saying is what if I did something like this. Uh, then I would say, all right, if I look at this half, I've got a small amount of mass at a short distance. And over here, I would say I have a lot of mass at a large distance. And so, right now, the torque here would be much greater than the torque over here. So that's why if I tried to balance it, 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 it won't. It'll do this. So if you added the weight to the ah. center on the, right, on the left side. Of the so if I added some torque over here, maybe I could balance the torque that I get from this weight and this one with the torque from that one. Right? That's what you're saying. So I'll give it a try. And so that's probably not enough torque. Maybe a little more. Uh, maybe a little more. Ooh. Maybe a little more. Maybe a little more torque. Oh, still not enough. Uh, a little more. A little more. <laughs> a little more. Uh, it, it didn't happen. But maybe a little more torque. <laughs> Yay! Okay, so now the, the torque coming from the weight of this and the weight of this and my finger, those three torques are equal to the torque on that one. Which would just be the weight of the ruler. Which would be the weight of the ruler. Okay. And so when you go to calculate it, you would take the weight. Now, I, I should be careful. I wouldn't call it... You could, you could think of this as two different ways. You could think of this as two pieces, or you could think of it as one giant piece with the center mass right here. And that might be the best way to make it easy for yourself, is to say, ignore this part on that side and put all of the weight of the ruler right at its center. And so this would be a torque that way. So if I could get it to balance with this, and maybe I can reduce the torque on this side by changing the, the distance so maybe something right there and so now if I hang some weight maybe now I can do what you're asking <laughs> yeah so that, that would be enough and that'd be too much and so maybe I can move it in move it in move it in ah 
And so now I would have torque. But something like that. So you get the idea. Let me not take any more time, but, but I can get those torques to balance. Right. And, and that's the beginning part of this chapter is really, and it, the, the hardest part of this chapter, to be quite honest, is right here. What is a torque? Why do I keep using the name? It's not just something that we use different in semantics just because we're talking about rotation versus translation, but it actually is mathematically more complex. It involves these things. Now, with that in mind, let me show you then another way of thinking about torque that will become very useful and even easier to think about when we do the problem. So let me leave the equation up here for the torque. And let me draw this picture. All right, so I'll go back. So here's the pivot. Here's this long object that I'm going to rotate. Um, and let's come back here and say I'm going to grab the object right about here and I'm going to pull it with a force of F and I'm going to say that if I'm thinking about rotating an object I want to think about more than just the force I'll say it again torque is more than force uh, I would put the distance involved, I would put the force involved, and I would put the angle involved. So if I draw those in my picture, let's see, the R means the distance from the pivot to the force, so there's the R. If you remember then, this angle theta was this angle right here that is the angle what we like to say is between these two between the R and the F so here's my sine theta I think my lights still on yeah okay and then that's how I drew the picture let me give you another way very useful way of thinking about this same equation uh, let me grab a different set of colors here uh, maybe in orange and instead of writing the force in its components, let's write R as its components. So I'm going to draw an orange right here becoming the hypotenuse of a triangle. And if you look closely at this, this angle theta, okay, which is between this and, you know, straight down here, uh, would be the same as, let's see if I can go through the math here with you, but I guess I would say then, oh, sorry, that's not what I want. This is what I want. These are what you would call vertical angles in a geometry class. They would be equal to each other. But because I have a right triangle, this distance right here is opposite of the sine. So this would be R sine theta. Now here's why I say that. is because another way to look at torque, and often a better way, not all the time, so I have a disclaimer there. But a lot of times, to look at torque, you're better off to think about these two together and call it the perpendicular distance. Hey, here's what I mean by perpendicular distance. Notice the force was applied right here. But if I draw a line up and down, and then I draw a perpendicular distance from the line to the pivot, 
that would be equal to these two together. And so we often call this R perpendicular. I heard one of you say it earlier, that's what we call the lever arm. Notice it is not the actual physical distance. Notice it's not even part of the physical object. And I think that's why it can confuse students. You, you're looking at some distance that is not even part of the physical object. This is the rod right here. This is the distance from the pivot to where the force is. R is actually part of the physical object. But this R perpendicular is not part of the physical object. But it is still very useful distance because it means I don't have to think about these two factors separately but collectively as one. Well, let's go back to this wrench. So here is a bolt. Here is this wrench on the bolt. Somebody grabs this wrench and as you pointed out earlier, they would be foolish not to grab the wrench at its maximum distance. But let's say they can't for whatever reason. They're working on an engine and there's other parts in the way. So instead of grabbing it here, they grab it here. Now let's say I'm trying to loosen the bolt, so I'll go counterclockwise. And of course I think you got the idea that probably the best way to apply the force then would be this way. But let's just say this person, for whatever reason, pushes that way. <laughs> Maybe I won't make the arrow so long. They apply that way. Now, for two reasons, they're not getting the maximum effort of their force. They, they don't have the distance and they don't have the angle right. So in order to get the amount of torque they need to remove this bolt, they're going to have to make up for it with a lot of force. So I would say that's the reason why it's probably not a good way to grab this bolt and push on this bolt this way because you're, you're, you, you have to make up for lack of mental power with muscle power. Okay, but that aside, here's what I want you to see. If I wanted to calculate the torque, I would do this. I would draw a line along that direction, figure out where it pivots around, and draw the perpendicular distance. Instead of trying to figure out this R and this angle. Both would work, but the perpendicular distance has the two together. So I'm going to box both of these because you will find that nine times out of ten, this is a better way to look at it. You just have to worry about distances and you don't have to worry about angles. However, one time out of ten, we've got to do the angle involved. And so that's the whole idea here of our torque. Now, that's really the main part of this chapter. Uh, let me show you two more things and we'll call it a, a, a wrap and we'll actually be done with the chapter. I mean, we'll do some examples maybe when we come back here. But your author then gets into the idea here of what would it keep or what would you need then to make something stable. Now remember, the big picture is the forces up and down got to match. Forces left and right have to match. In other words, they have to add to zero. And now I would say the torques clockwise have to match the torques counterclockwise. And that actually becomes quite, I don't know if easy is the right word, but in certain cases, and your author does a good job of showing uh, stability here, and he says, let's just take an object, and he looks like he's got a little stump nose pencil here. I'll, I'll just use this little, get a nice flat spot here, the debris off. But what would make this thing stable would be the fact that if this center of mass is somewhere between the base, it would be stable, 
because if you look in this next picture, watch what happens if it leans a little bit. And so if it leans just a little bit, <laughs> and uh, maybe get something maybe a little more stable. So if I lean a little bit, what would happen is the normal force would be right here. And if we call the pivot its center of, of mass here, or maybe I'll call the pivot like he does right here on the edge, notice that gravity then pulls it back, and in this case, a clockwise direction. And of course, it won't go too much further because once this corner touches, then we get a normal force from this edge, and that stops it from continuing its rotation. So it rotates back to a, a stable location. Now, of course, if you twist the object a little too far, so if you go way over, then the center of gravity goes beyond the edge of the base, beyond this place. And now, instead of making this object rotate clockwise, it now makes it rotate counterclockwise. And it just gets worse and worse. So the center of mass needs to be over the edges of the base. If it goes too far, oh, I thought that was going to be far enough, but it came back. If you go too far, then it just pulls it in the other direction. And so it's where is the center of mass compared to the base? And the short answer is, as long as that center of mass is over the base, you're golden. It's going to stay up there. Uh, I don't know if you've ever tried this game. It's, it's kind of fun. Most people don't stand with their feet together because if you bend over, what happens if you bend over too much? <laughs> And if your center of mass goes beyond the tip of your toes, you fall over. Or if I lean too far to the left, right there, <laughs> and the center of mass goes beyond the edge of my base, I'm going to tip. And so it's a combination of what is the size of your base and what is or where is your center of mass? This is a fun one. Most people look at this and they go, well, yeah, uh, I can see how it's, it's kind of heavier up here. So the center of mass is probably kind of right there and you put it right there, it's over the base, it's stable, and you're like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Now, if I turn it around, the center of mass is down here somewhere, but notice how it's cut at an angle? Ooh. Uh, and it's cut just right. It, it's cut so that it kind of looks like it should fall. Because most people look at this and they go, well, center mass is halfway. Well, no, it's not. See how this side is fatter than here? So the center mass is a little bit low. And it's low enough that when you cut it at an angle, it's actually still just inside of the base. Whereas it looks like halfway up, if the center mass was there, it would tip it over. In fact, if I add a little weight at the top that flares out, that will put the center of mass at its center, which is too far, and it will then fall over. But as long as it's under its base, it's good. In fact, maybe I'll call it a quit for today with one of my favorite, is what we call the flying bird. And the flying bird, it's kind of hard to see from your distance, but if you look at the beak, can you see the wing tips are actually higher up than the beak? And what you couldn't tell from your distance is there's lead weights inside of the wing tips. And so the wing tips don't go much beyond the beak, but there's a lot of weight there. Whereas this side of the beak, it's just a hollow, <laughs> hollow plastic body. And so there's a lot of distance, but not much weight. And then because of that, the center of mass of this thing 
is actually right at its beak. And it's stable at its beak. And so it gives it this illusion of flight. And of course, if you add kind of a little stand to it that tapers, it really gives it kind of a neat vision of flight. But it's actually very stable and it's matching the torques because torques have force and distances. And so the center of mass is right at its beak. All right, well, I'll call it quits for today. That, uh, there's a few more things to say about this chapter, but for the most part, the idea was to get into making something rotate. Torque. Torques, torques are tough. Rotations are tough. So this and the next chapter are some pretty tough chapters. Maybe some of the harder ones we've seen. All right. Well, I'll see you guys later, both uh, in person and online. Call it quits and... Hey, hey, well, welcome back. Uh, as you uh, were just watching on the uh, video, we've been talking about uh, stability and really torque. This was our way of introducing you to torque. And uh, the in-person people finished up and we did a lab and I thought I'd come back and then just kind of wrap up this, this chapter. So this, this last part of the, the video will be for not only you guys online, but also the in-person people. So I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you guys know. That way when we come back, uh, for the next lecture, we can get started into the next chapter. But we were so close to finishing, I thought, let's, let's just wrap this up and, and really get to the meat of it where I can get some examples for you. There, there is one more thing to say. And so let me, let me just point out here that this was kind of the big picture. If we had an object and if we wanted it to be stable, that is, if we wanted it to be stationary, static equilibrium. Condition number one is that if you add up all the forces, you would get zero. Because that one we started the lecture with. Because if they weren't zero, you would have an acceleration either in the X or the Y or both and it would accelerate. But the new piece is the sum of the torques. And so we spent, as you know, quite a bit of time kind of developing what a torque is. And these are our two conditions of equilibrium. And that's really kind of the, the summary of this. Now, let me just mention then that torque was a combination of three factors. One is how hard do you push, so the force. The other one is where you push, so there's the R. And the other one is what direction do you push, and that's the, the sign data. And so coming over to here again and just again kind of a repeat of what you just saw on the video and what I did, a, uh, I guess that would be 12 hours ago or something. Uh, but what I was trying to say at the very end here and we'll illustrate it now, a very useful way of thinking about the torque is to incorporate the position and the angle together and have what we call the lever arm. And I was illustrating it, I believe, in orange, and so I'll do the same thing again. If you take, well, the distance to the force as R, because that's what this, this R means, and then you take the line of the force, we often call this the line of the action, and you break this into a right triangle, the piece that is coming towards it would be R sine theta where, of course, theta is the angle between the R and the F, so it makes that angle there, theta. And so we look for what we call the perpendicular distance. And the last thing, this is where we ran out of time and I thought I'd finish it up, is your author says then, let's look and call these simple machines and I guess I would just say simple machine is a, a lever system. And uh, we could 
like make a pry bar. Uh, in fact, that's the first one I want to show you. So let's come over to your, your author's book. I guess this is figure number 22. And your author says, here's a quote unquote simple machine. Uh, he's got this crowbar and he puts the end of the crowbar under the nail. Maybe I'll make the picture a little bigger here. Let me close this and that'll make it bigger, but I'll even do maybe 150 percent, something like that. And so this crowbar has this pivot point right here. And then of course somebody's pushing in on it with a force. And so they label across the bottom as the perpendicular distance. And points out then if you're in equilibrium, now to be quite honest, if you want to pull the nail out of the board, you want to do more than equilibrium. But if you just think about what is it required just to balance it, and then of course say that you got to go more than that, this is where the equilibrium condition could actually be applied. Even though, like I said, you want to go a hair above it, you can find out what is it going to take. Because if we think of this right here as the pivot point, then the force that the nail is putting back on the uh, crowbar is then, you know, what he calls Fn. But it is also then a short distance, which your author labels here as a perpendicular distance, and he calls it I naught. But those two torques have to balance. I like to write it this way. I like to come over here and, of course, use what your author is doing, this perpendicular distance, and like to say something like this. If I have a lever point and then I have this long bar and I apply a force here, which, of course, then whatever I'm opposing is applying a force back on it. And in this case, it's a nail, so I'm trying to pull a, a nail out of a, of a board. I like to say that if I call my force little f and this force big f, and the reason for that is this perpendicular distance, uh, let me call it big R, and this perpendicular distance, so let me call it little r. Maybe just to make sure that I'm trying to emphasize a perpendicular distance, I'll use the perpendicular symbol underneath it. But the torque from my hand is making it go counterclockwise. And the torque from the, the nail or whatever it is, maybe I'm trying to lift up a heavy rock, is the other direction clockwise and like I said if I'm just right at the balance point I would say the torque which we'll call it little f times capital R must be then equal to uh, little r times capital F <laughs> and I'll exaggerate not only use capital and lower case but make them bigger because what I want you to see in this then is how much bigger F can be than the little f, the, the force I'm applying by my, my hand. And, and this is why we call it a, a lever system. Um, who's the ancient Greek who discovered this? Is this Archimedes who says, uh, give me a lever and a place to stand and I can lift the world. And so this is his way of describing how amazingly a simple machine can be a lever system. I, I like to write it this way. If you take the capital F and divide it by the lowercase f, that should be the same as the capital R divided by the lowercase r. And so this lever system magnifies uh, the force. And so you get a huge amount of force. And so now you see why we call it a simple machine. Now, the simple just means no energy is coming from anywhere else. And so this is not a machine like a car where, you know, you have the engine in the car and it gets its energy from the fuel. Um, if uh, we're talking about a, uh, maybe a hand drill. Uh, 
you know a hand drill is a machine but we call those complex machines because they get their energy from more than the operator but a bicycle is a simple machine a bicycle all the energy comes from the rider and the wheels and the uh, gears and the chain all add an important part and it's much nicer if you've got to go a long distance on a bicycle than say walking or running um, and of course walking and running is better and more efficient than if I've got to swim a long distance and so your efficiency comes into play but in all of those cases if you're going to go a mile a mile on a bike and a mile running and a mile swimming I have a different efficiency overall but all the energy comes from you the operator of it and so we're after efficiency and in this case maybe the efficiency is I just need enough force to maybe lift up a car uh, I have plenty of energy to lift up a car that's not the issue the issue is I don't have enough force to lift up a car and so I get a lever system in fact you can see it in here then if I actually made these move and so if I were to push down you'll see that this small force would move a big distance and since it's an arc let me call it capital F but over here with this lever system it would only move up a small S and so yes this simple machine amplified the force but sadly there was a price to pay and that was distance uh, if you ride a bike you'll see the same thing that's why you have those multiple gears you can put it down in first gear especially when you're going up a hill to get up a hill you need a lot of force and instead of getting all of that massive force from just your legs you can use the lever system of the gears to do that and therefore you don't have to apply as much force with your legs and so you don't have to push as hard to get up the hill but you do pay a price and that price is if you're in that low gear you got to go around and around and around and around and around and your your pedals go around a lot so you got to move your legs a lot you got to move a big distance and the wheel barely moves but you don't have to push hard and so you don't get any free energy <laughs> it's a small force but a big distance that results in a big force and a small distance and again just like lifting up this this nail oh watch your author gives you another one uh, maybe I won't say too much about it this one's pretty obvious too they just put the fulcrum point slightly different here in the wheelbarrow but a wheelbarrow the same principle applies that you're going to pivot right here at the center of the wheel <clears throat> and then of course you load up the the wheelbarrow with a lot of weight and so maybe we fill this up with dirt and I would even say if you're not gonna fill the whole thing up with 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 dirt in fact this this happened recently with my my, my kids uh, we had a bunch of bricks and they, they started loading them right here and I'm like what what are you doing we've only got a few bricks I know they're kind of heavy but put them up here and they thought I was crazy at first until they tried to lift it up and then I moved them up front and then they go whoa what a difference and yes it's a, it's, a, it's a lever system in other words the center of gravity of all the dirt or bricks that are in the wheelbarrow times a short distance has to be equal to the force from my hand times this longer distance and so the fulcrum's on a different side but the math and the principle is still exactly the same that a small force at a big distance can equal then a big force at a small distance and so I was trying to get the bricks at the front of the the wheelbarrow so that this number would be small and of course then I can have this number very big and we can lift a lot of bricks with really little effort and so there's our leverage system now your author shows kind of a uh, another leverage system uh, it's a pulley leverage system it's a little different well here shows some more uh, leverage ones there but it's the multiple ropes here and so I'll say this one kind of quickly in passing since it doesn't really have to do with torque in fact I'll point out that it just comes back to the uh, some of the forces and so this is 
material that we could have done before this chapter. It doesn't involve torques here. But if you have a pulley system, and so let me just look at you know this one here. What's nice about taking a rope and putting it over what we call a fixed pulley and then around a movable pulley and then back up to the other pulley and we put something heavy here. If you stand over here and you pull on this rope with say a force of T for tension in here, notice that as the rope wraps around this bottom pulley, you've got the tension in the rope pulling twice. Really, that's this idea. And so here's our free body diagram that we've got the weight pulling down, but we've got the tension pulling up twice. And so if I'm trying to lift, say, 200 pounds, this downward force of 200 pounds needs to be equal to twice the tension. So that means the tension needs to be 100 pounds. That means I need to pull with 100 pounds, and there's the advantage. The advantage is I am going to pull with only 100 pounds, but I'm going to lift a 200-pound object. And so there's our mechanical advantage. And then your author goes on to show you, you can do all kinds of amplifications with your force with multiple pulleys, and so here, they have two fixed pulleys called a gain pulley and then the movable pulley. And if you watch again, as it comes around and circles around and comes back, this rope actually is touching this movable pulley three times. And so whatever I pull out, and again, let's just say I pull with 100 pounds, because it wraps around three times, I'm actually pulling upward of 300 pounds. So I can lift something that is 300 pounds. And then, of course, we could have something even more complex, something like this, where you can see the rope moves around. And they put the gang pulley now down here, so it's movable. And that way, the rope is actually touching this thing four times. And so right here, if I pull with 100, pulling up on this contraption is 400. And so your author takes a moment. But like I said, since that one's not torque, I think that one's a, a little easier uh, to do. What I thought I would do then is wrap up this chapter by saying, well, let me try some numbers here. Uh, you've got uh, some ones to work with. And since you guys are life science, I thought you would appreciate this one. This is actually what you might call a reverse lever system. And that might be more important to you guys in the life science because us humans are endoskeletons. And a lot of organisms have endoskeletons. And there's something interesting and I don't know if you want to call it fortunate or unfortunate about an endoskeleton. It, it, it's both. But let's try to lift something up. And so this diagram, I don't know if you can tell, is supposed to be the bicep muscle right here. Uh, this is the hand. The hand is holding a physics book. And I guess it would look something like this. Let me grab a physics book here. And so it's kind of kind of this position right here. And so you're just you're just holding this this physics book and saying, all right, here I hold it. And what holds up the physics book? And of course, the whatever joint this is, I'll call it the elbow joint. I'm sure it has probably a fancier name here. But this is the pivot point of my arm, my, my elbow. And so I have some torques. Ah, did, you, did you catch that right away? Torques, right? This is, this is a pivot problem. This is a rotational problem. It, it's not about force, it's about torque. Now, you know that I've been emphasizing, I'll say it again, torque is more than just a force. And it's not just semantics. It has to do, in other words, the torque has to do with not only a force, but where it is applied and at what angle is it applied. Now this problem, they've tried to make it easy and say, well, here's the bicep muscle and it looks like they've got a 90 degree bend to it. All right, so as you'll see, our angles will be 90 degrees. So the easier part here is the angle. But it's actually the position of where the bicep muscle is in relationship to where the hand is that makes this, I think, a, an interesting problem here. And 
hopefully you will find it interesting too. So let me come back here. I'm going to put the book in my hand. I'm going to hold it here and just simply ask this question. How much force is from my bicep muscle? And I'm sure you would say, well, a, a textbook's not that heavy. It's only, and in this picture, they give it four kilograms, which is about 8.8 .8 pounds. When, uh, that seems a little heavier than this book. I guess I'm not real sure, but I'll, I'll go with it and say, all right, here is the mass of the textbook, four kilograms. And then, of course, the arm itself, the forearm, has a mass and they're giving it at 2.5 but can you begin to see the concept before we get into the numbers do you see how the bicep muscle is connected a short distance away from the pivot and it's only four centimeters and it's because of that to get a significant amount of torque around your elbow joint, the force from your bicep muscle needs to be huge because it has to make up for the fact that a textbook is 38 centimeters out on your arm. And you're gonna get a lot of torque just because the distance of the textbook is so much. Not, not that the textbook is real heavy, but I do want you to see some numbers here and I think you'll be a, a really quite amazed at really how much strength the bicep muscle is actually applying and of course why if you tried to lift something too heavy you know you would strain that muscle. You'd go, ah, I think I, 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 I pulled a muscle or if you're at the gym picking up too much weight over time you, you'll begin to see, you know, I was, I was only curling 35 pounds but it's amazing how much force is being asked from that, that bicep muscle or any of your muscles because the way they're connected in an endoskeleton, they're all connected uh, real close to the pivot point here. It's why I will say that the ape family, like the chimpanzee, uh, is so incredibly powerful. Uh, yes, they do have big muscles, but that's only half the story. They also have their b muscles of the connected a little further out. And in some cases, I think the, the uh, great ape, it's really far out. And they get a lot more leverage and a lot more torque, uh, not because their muscles are so big, but it's that too. But it's because of where they're connected. And so if you were just to connect this bicep muscle, you know, twice the distance out, everything you curl would double. You know, if, if you're used to picking up a 35 pound weight and curling it, now all of a sudden you're picking up 70 pounds and curling it with the same effort. And that's a, that's a big increase just because of, of distance. Now, I will point out, like I said before, you don't get anything for free here and you pay that price with distance which in the case of a human because it's connected so close I could actually then extend my arm out all the way straight and my bicep muscle only has to stretch a little bit. If my bicep is connected further out on my arm to get my arm to go straight do you see how far my bicep would, would have to stretch? And uh, for the eight family, they, they can't do that. And so they go, <laughs> and that's the best they can do. You know, that's why the traditional symbol of, a, of an ape is bent arms and bent body. You know, it's like this. Because they just can't straighten out. They got the advantage of the leverage, but they pay a price in the extension of their in their muscles. All right, well, maybe I shouldn't say too much about the life science because that's not my specialty and I will probably foul up something along the way. But back over then to here, let's actually solve this problem. Let's actually put some numbers in to here. And like I said, I want you to be pretty amazed here. 
So let me start with the idea that notice I am lifting or holding only four kilograms. But if this, in kind of a sick way, were to cut off my arm right here and just let this bicep muscle hang down, and I would actually strap the bicep muscle right to something that's heavy, uh, let's ask how much strength is that bicep just lifting straight up? Because with this mechanism, I'm just holding four kilograms. But if this heavy object was down on the ground and my bicep muscle just had this like cable on it and goes down and hooks to it, what's the equivalent of lifting that up? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna run through these numbers and of course, the fundamental idea here is that the sum of all the torques would equal zero. That's our equilibrium. The sum of all the torques equals zero. So in this case, why don't I stick to the tradition where things that rotate counterclockwise are positive and things that rotate it clockwise are negative. So I'm going to come over here and take a look. And so here's the pivot point. The bicep muscle is pulling up on my bone, whatever the forearm bone is called. And so it's pulling up here. And that is making my hand go in a positive direction. So I am going to say plus. And then of course I'm going to use the perpendicular distance and the force from the bicep. So the perpendicular distance, and I guess I need to check here, I think I saw four centimeters. Yeah, four centimeters. So I'm going to put 0 0.04 meters, since I'll do torque in newton meters that we talked about, times the force of the bicep. All right, so there's my first torque. That's, again, a positive one. Now let's come over here and look at the other two. I say the other two because we have the weight of the arm and the weight of the arm would tend to make it go in a clockwise direction, which I'm going to call negative. And then the force of the book is making it go in a clockwise direction. So both of these would be negative torque and 16 and 38. All right. So I'm going to put a negative and I'll put a distance of 16 and I will put a weight of mg, so 2.5 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. So there's the weight of the forearm, that's the force. Uh, there's the distance and then the negative torque. Uh, the other negative torque is the weight of the, of the book. Uh, let's see, we said 38 centimeters, so I'll put point 38 meters. So I'll put the mass of 4 kilograms and I'll put 9.8 meters per second squared. And again, just to balance it will tell me how much force do I need from my bicep muscle just to balance this. Okay, so grabbing my calculator here. Uh, why don't I do these negative ones first? Uh, 0.16 times 2.5 times 9.8 and also added to 0.38 times 4 times 9.8. Uh, that comes out to be 18.8. And when I move it to the other side, it now becomes a positive. Then when I divide that by 0.04, we're looking at a force of... 470.4 newtons. Now maybe so I can do a comparison. How much mass would that be? If I just had a, a big box here like this air uh, filter right here, if it, 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 how much would that thing weigh? If that thing weighed 470 
newtons than what would its mass we're talking about. So I'm going to divide that by 9.7 and get 48 kilograms. <laughs> so, so this was the, like I said, the amazing number that I, I want you to see. We have kind of a reverse lever system with our endoskeleton here. We have the advantage of moving a great distance, but really not lifting much force. Because this bicep muscle is the equivalent, like I said, in kind of a gross, crude way. If I were to cut off my arm right here and take this bicep muscle and hook it onto a weight down here, I would be lifting up 48 kilograms. But instead, I'm just holding a textbook and only holding up 4 kilograms. Ron, you're looking at me like... Yeah, so, so, so the force is actually this. So this is the force from the bicep muscle. Yeah. So here's the force of the bicep muscle. But I just wanted to do a comparison. That would be the equivalent of, of basically lifting up this, this uh, big or good size air cleaner here. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a big object. And so, like I said, I would be strapping down here. And it, the, the force from my bicep muscle picking this straight up is actually the same as if I was holding this textbook. All right. Well, if that one wasn't exciting enough for you, let's try another one. Because I think the even more interesting one is another one your author lists, and that is, what about the back? And so he gives a picture of this individual who is potentially going to really hurt their back. Oh, because they're going to pick up a box and they're picking it up not with their legs as the phrase goes the phrase is look you got something heavy you you bend it down and you pull it up and, and I think for this bicep one you're see, you're starting to see why you you want to keep that back straight and you want to lift with your legs as the, as the phrase goes don't lift with that back because again, we, uh, the endoskeleton here has kind of a reverse uh, leverage system. And so the forces have to be huge so that we can have the advantage of a lot of distance and mobility and we can move around. And so I, I'm not making fun of the endoskeleton design. It's, it's, it's great. But the forces that are with inside the body are really large and in this case they could be so large that they could damage the structural integrity of what it's made out of a disc and so we call this a slip disc you would you would pull so hard on that spine that the cartilage that is between the vertebrae would get smashed or squeezed out it, it these forces can be quite amazing so let's run through another example here let's let's do this person and use their numbers they don't quite give us enough numbers so I'm gonna throw some into this picture because in this diagram they give me angles uh, they give me a little picture of the uh, inside working or the endoskeleton of the spinal cord uh, they give me some distances. They give me the center of mass of the upper body and the center of mass of the box where they're lifting. They give me a bunch of angles and perpendicular distances. But the, but the one thing that they don't say here is what exactly is the number that they're lifting up. So for us, let's do this. Let, let me give us some numbers here. Let's just make some up here. So let me take the mass of a box. And let's just say that this is me in the grocery store getting uh, a bag of dog food for my dog. And I got a pretty good sized dog, so I get those big bags. Uh, they're about 25 kilograms. Okay. So it's a little over 50 pounds. Uh, there's, actually, there's smaller ones than 
I've been getting the smaller ones, uh, but I'll just go with the 25 since I mentioned it. All right, so I'm gonna pick up this 25 kilogram bag of dog food and try to put it in my shopping cart. But if I do that incorrectly, I could really put a lot of stress on my back, which could potentially injure my back. And like I said, you might be amazed at this number. Now, also in here is what they call the weight of the upper body. And so, of course, if you're bending at the hip here and you kind of bend forward and lift up, you, you're not lifting your whole body. Uh, I'm about 75 kilograms for my, my whole body. Uh, why don't I just take roughly two-thirds of it as being the upper part? So I'm going to take the upper part of my body as being 50 kilograms. All right. So I'll say mass of the upper body is 50 kilograms. All right, with those two in place, maybe I'll go ahead and just give myself a number for the weight of the box or the bag, and then I'll do the weight of the upper body. So let me take the 25 and multiply it by 9.8. So this is 245 Newtons. And the 50 kilograms would be double, so that's 490 Newtons. All right, so that will be some numbers that I'm gonna give you in this. But now let's watch the mechanism. Where do you pivot? And that's where I wanna get started with because with these problems, you do need to ask yourself, is this a pivot problem or is this a translational problem? You know, is it a rotation or a translational problem? Because again, translations, we're interested in forces. Rotations, we're interested in torques. And torques are more complicated as I keep saying, that's what this chapter is about. And of course, it, we wouldn't be doing a translational problem in this chapter. That's not the educational lesson. <laughs> the educational lesson is a rotational problem, a pivot. And so sure enough, the, the pivot is right back here in the hips. And so we're going to pivot. We're going we're gonna to go from leaning over to leaning up, okay? So we're going to pick it up. And so your author says, okay, here is the pivot point. Okay, and so let's see what are the forces which result in the torques involved. Because if you're just gonna come over and do enough to hold it, that's equilibrium. And of course, technically, you have to go a little bit more than that to lift it up and put it in the shopping cart. So let's just do a calculation of equilibrium. Okay, what would it take for just to hold it there. So like we did on the other one, let me go, the sum of the torques have to be zero. So I'm gonna add up the, the torques. And of course, to do that, we need to look at all the forces, and I think there's three of them again. So this is a lot like the, the bicep one. And if we come over here and look at what is making it pivot, uh, you can see the author kind of writes it back here that there is some muscles in the back. And so these back muscles are then connected up here to your spine. And of course, you guys who know a lot more about biology than I do will know that there's not just like one uh, <laughs> ligament attached. It's not more like an engineering problem where we'll just have one big strong cable. Uh, the human body has a bunch of ligaments and so they're attached all over the place and so to say where they're actually attached is kind of difficult. But we're going to overly simplify the problem. We're going to say that let's just take all of those ligaments and say they're attached to the equivalent of being about two-thirds the distance up the spine. Uh, we don't even really need that number because they give us some numbers here. But you would say then that as this 
person bends over with their back. This is going to tighten up. And they're, uh, that's what lifts them up. That's what, in this picture, makes the person go in a positive rotation. Remember, counterclockwise. And that's what this force is calling here. See, F sub B, this is the force from the, the back. And this is why, conceptually, this can be so difficult for your body to do because they're pointing here and the distance of these ligaments to the pivot point is probably only roughly eight centimeters. And so you don't have much of a perpendicular distance. And so to get a lot of torque, you're going to have to have a lot of force from your back. And so that's what this problem is saying. How much force does this need to be? So one of three torques is the torque coming from the muscle in the back, the back muscle. The other two we mentioned would be the weight of the upper body making it go in a clockwise direction and the weight of the box making it go in a clockwise direction. So coming over to here, setting it equal to zero, I'll do the same thing. There is a plus, there is a minus, and there is another minus. Those are the three torques involved in this, this problem. I'll do the back one first. And I'll, like I said, let's just do perpendicular distance times the force. They said it was 8 centimeters, so I'm going to put 0 0.08 in meters. I'll just drop the units for just a second there. And then times the force from the back muscle. Uh, the other two are negative. Those are the weight of the upper body and the box. Uh, why don't I do the upper body first? The upper body is 490 newtons. Oh, I said I was going to pass on the units for the moment. Okay, so 490. I need to come to the picture to get the distance. They did show that uh, for this individual then, this perpendicular distance, looks like they're pointing right here and saying it's 35 centimeters. So I'll put 0.35. And then the other torque coming from the weight of whatever you're picking up. And like I said, I'm going to pretend it's just a bag of dog food here. And of course, its distance from here to here is 50 centimeters. And so I'll put this as a 0.5 in terms of meters. And of course, this all equals zero. So after a little bit of calculator work, I will come up with a number. An amazingly big number is my, my point. So let's see. Um, I have, and I'll do these negative ones first, 0 0.35, whoops, 0.35 times 490 and another negative one is 0.5 times 245 and all of those together is 295 in fact I'll write it separately so minus 294 not 5 294 but I wanted to take a moment to then say Again, the units for torque are newton times a meter. So this would be so many newton meters. So when I bring it over to this side and then divide by a meter, we're going to be left with units of just a newton. And so number-wise, I need to divide this by 0 0.08. And I have a force that is 3,675 newtons. And, and you can see I'm always just amazed at this number because you got to remember here, this is the force for my back muscle, but what am I picking up? I'm only picking up something that weighs 245 newtons. This is well over, what, 15 times? Let me divide that by 245. Oh, exactly 15. 15! 15. I, I'm picking up a pretty heavy bag, but what my back is doing is 15 times more. So, like I said, I'm always just absolutely amazed at how big this, this number is. And, and, and so, my back muscle easily can get strained. 
and, and maybe it's my age now. I never gave this too much thought until now when I go to the store. I mean, a decade or two ago, I thought nothing of it. I had a bag of dog food, grab it, throw it in. But now when I do that, I'm sorry the next day. I'm like, oh, wow, wow. Something really got strained here. And so it can be really tough on your, your back. Now, let's take this one a step further here. Because that's the force on your back muscle. There's something I want to point out that I don't know if you saw this, but it's definitely important to mention it. I didn't mention it on the uh, bicep one, but maybe I should have because I'll go back to the bicep. Remember I said there were three torques. There was one from the bicep, one from the weight of the forearm, one from the weight of the book. Wait a minute, what about this bone right here? Isn't this bone putting a force on the joint? Or, same question in this one. Your author says, well wait a minute, what about this force? He calls it F sub V. I, I guess the V is because there's a, a force on the, I was going to say hips, but maybe the author is referring to it as the vertebrae. There, 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 there is an interaction of bone on bone right there. Now, the good thing about that is that force doesn't come from my muscles. Uh, the amount of force from the bone is, you know, based upon just like a, a metal object here. I could like, okay, I'm putting a force and the force comes from the intermolecular forces between them. So, so bone on bone doesn't make me tired. It's the same reason why if I were to stand in a vertical position, you know, the force holding me up is really my bone, the molecules pushing me up. When I'm in a squatted position, okay, now I need to use the force from my muscles and that's when I'm going to get tired. So bone on bone from a human perspective is a different feeling force, but it's still a force. And that's what I want to look at now. Uh, I kind of passed over it with the force in the joint here. But we should really look at what your author is calling then how much force is being put on the vertebrae from the hip bone. And so again, this would be an interesting calculation because you are then compressing the vertebrae. And the vertebrae are different than just my legs. When my legs stand like this, I've just got this long bone then connected to other, oh, they flare out into two bones here. And so I've just got these bone pushing on, on bone. It would be just like stacking a metal piece on top of a, or a cardboard piece on top of a metal piece. You know, and they're like, okay, <laughs> no problem. But in the vertebrae, we're putting something in between them, some cartilage, and then we start pushing on it, that stuff can easily get squeezed beyond its limit and do some serious damage. And we want that cartilage in there, something squishy so that you, the whole vertebrae thing can, can bend. We don't, we don't want a, a solid piece like we do in the, in the legs. So you will notice Again, for both the example I did with the bicep and this one here, you will notice that I did not include that in the torque calculation. Why not? Oh good, my virtual in-class student just answered that one. See, remember torque has three pieces. It's not just the force, but it's also the distance away from the pivot point. And so when we look at this picture, I purposely skipped over the force at the pivot because the distance would be zero. Uh, that's worth putting the equation on the board here. Let me, let me come over here. All right. So 
if I put the equation for torque as RF sine theta, and I kind of roughly do a free body diagram with that backbone. So here's the back. And actually, I guess I got to do more than the back because the box is held by the arms. So uh, the arms come down here, something like that. But we have this piece, which we call the weight of the upper body. Uh, we have the box we're holding, and so we have the weights of the box. Uh, we have all these ligaments, that is the force from the back muscle, but we also have then a force from the hip bone pushing up on the vertebrae. And I'll say it again, when I did this problem, you will notice that I did a torque from here, a torque from here, and a torque from here. But I want to take just a moment to say, why did I skip over this one? And on the first problem, I, I thought it would be too much to, to bring up. So I just did the three and moved on to this one. But you're going to see that in a lot of problems here because, remember, the torque has this factor of R. And so in this problem, the force between the hip bone and the vertebrae might be a big number, but the distance is zero. And so it doesn't pivot it at all. It, it was like the example I gave earlier on in the video where I was kind of standing near to this table and I said, what if I had a bolt right here and I put a wrench on the bolt, but then I grabbed it with my hand right on the bolt. <laughs> I don't get any torque. I can have all the push and pull that I want and that would just maybe make it translate. And so the table would actually move back and forth as I apply the force. But I wouldn't get it to rotate. That does not make it rotate. And torque is more than force. All right. So like I said, I wanted to take, and maybe I took too long, to point that out, that there's actually four forces involved here, but yet I only did three torques. But let's take this one step further. Because I've been focusing all my attention on the torques, and rightfully so, because I think that's the hardest thing for you. But remember, there's two conditions of equilibrium, right? The one condition is the torque, and that's what I've been doing. But also the forces have to add up. So now that we have found the force from the back muscle, let me highlight it along with the force from the box and the upper body. And let's see if we could now answer this question. How much force is coming from the hip bone onto the back? Now, like I said, from a human body perspective, that would feel different to you. It's just like, I'll say it again, standing. See, standing, the force is coming between the bones. And I don't get tired, but there is a force there. And in fact, if it was enough force, I guess it would break my bones. Now, fortunately, my bones are strong enough to hold my weight. But if I had a disease where I had weak bones, I, I would try to stand like this, and then all of a sudden, my bones would crack, they would break. And it would even be kind of a weird feeling uh, because it would be this large force on my bones, but it didn't come from my muscles. Of course, once they broke, then all kinds of other things would happen and I'd be in probably a lot of pain. Uh, it's actually very similar to my mom's description when she broke a hip. I mean, she was just standing there and the hip just broke, it just gave out. And she was like, I wouldn't do anything, I wasn't pushing on anything. I, and, uh, you know, and I'm like, okay, mom, but <laughs> there was a lot of force on your hips. Um, I mean, at least it was the weight of your body and you're, you're old and petite and she's got, um, what's a disease where you lose bone, bone mass? Um, uh, sorry, it escapes me at the, at the moment here, but uh, 
maybe maybe it'll come to me but anyway so she uh, loses bone mass anyways and so her hip breaks and fortunately you know her doctor was able to fix that and then give her medicine for her osteoporosis that's it osteoporosis and so she's uh, doing well I'm happy to report all right uh, she doesn't have to rock with a cane anymore and so that's that's good because uh, for a while there we thought that would you know she would need to walk with a cane for the rest of her life okay now that being said here I want to run through and I hope I gave myself enough room here on the, 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 the board here in fact maybe maybe I'll uh, just give myself some extra board space by blackening this for just a second and say all right let's try this one and keep in mind and here's going to be the key to this problem or any problem like this is I cannot get the force right here at the pivot point by doing torques because the torque is zero it, it goes away it's not in the equation so that's why I need to go back to condition number one and that's why I wanted to kind of put up here kind of this free body diagram uh, and I just realized I am going to need the diagram I can still see it so I'll put up here but I'm going to need some angles here and I'm going to go ahead and use the traditional grid of X and Y and so coming over here as you've seen me do a number of times and I'm going to continue let's look at the forces in the X direction and say the sum of the forces in the X directions equals zero and over here the sum of the forces in the Y direction equal zero and so let's add them up and so if I come over to here um, maybe I'll start with the maybe the easiest one this box you can see it's all in the Y direction nothing in the X direction the box as we said was 245 so I'm gonna put negative 245 Newtons in the Y column and nothing in the X column uh, the other force is the weight of the upper body which we said was 490 so again I'm going to put minus 490 Newtons in the X direction and nothing I'm sorry in the Y direction and nothing in the X direction that's the easier one now to do the force and the components of the force from the back muscle I'll need an angle and I turned off the display to you but I hope you'll trust me on this they show an angle here of what do they show it's like 29 degrees and so let me put it in the picture so you can see it but they draw a horizontal line here and call this 29 degrees and so as you've seen us do this a lot of times take that angle recognize where it is notice that the X direction would be adjacent to it so the cosine function is going to go with the X uh, which means the sine function will go with the Y uh, notice also that the force from the back is not only to the left but it's down so that means they're both negative all right so I've been talking more about the Y so the Y would be a negative it would be the force from the back which we said was three thousand six hundred and seventy five and then I will have sine of 29 degrees so there is the component in the Y direction from the force from the back and then over here I will have a negative and the force would be 3675 and it's going to be cosine of 29 degrees 
So these three forces each have a Y component. And of those first three forces, only one of them has an X component. And finally, we get to the main one we want. And the main one we want is this question about how much force is the hips putting on the spine. And so maybe I will think about the force on the vertebrae as being made out of a horizontal component. I'll call it force vertebrae x direction and force vertebrae y direction. And I'll say, okay, how, how much force do I, do I have there? And uh, that's, of course, where this comes into play. So this would go plus force on the vertebrae x. And over here, this would go plus force vertebrae y. All right, so I'll say it again. I've moved away from the, the new stuff for this chapter, which is the torque, realizing that I have to go back to the first condition of equilibrium to get the force at the pivot. Because there are a number of questions where you're asked to find, like we did, the force from the back, but then at the end of that, also find the force at the pivot point. And so I need to inform you that you, you can't do that by the torque. So you've got to go back to the first condition. So we have two conditions of equilibrium here. All right, fortunately then, I can then find the force in the x direction with a couple of steps in math and also the force from the vertebrae in the y direction with a couple of, of steps here. And so grabbing my calculator, I will take this number, which is 3,675, and multiply it by the cosine of 29 degrees. And so this would be 3,214 newtons in the x direction. And in the y direction, um, I'll just imagine these on the other side. So that'll be a plus 245. That'd be a plus 490. That'd be a plus 3,675 times the sine of 29. And this would come out to be 2,517 newtons. And so finally, I can answer the question, what is the amount of force coming from that hip bone, shoving into my vertebrae here, I will take the 3,214 and square it, and the 2,517 and square it, then take the square root. So 3,214 squared, 2,517 squared, add them together, and take the square root. And we're looking at 4,082 newtons. <laughs> wow. Let me remind you. All I did was pick up a bag of dog food at 245 newtons. And all of a sudden now, there is a compressional force on my spine from my hips of 4,080 newtons. Hopefully, the cartilage can handle that and it won't squeeze it and then split and I'll get a, a ruptured disc or worse still, squeeze it and it splits in half and oozes out and I've got a slip disc because uh, this could be really bad. Now, it's also worth taking one more calculation and say, well, what direction is this? And so coming over here in this picture, theta, Let's see what direction this force is. And, and here's why I'm curious about this, especially if I was in the life science and a doctor here. The spine being flexible because of the numerous vertebrae, 
could probably handle a push right along the direction of the spine better than something pushing it sideways. Some right here is going to like twist this first vertebrae up and give it a chance to come out even more so. So not only does it have a large force that's trying to get the disc, or I shouldn't say trying to get the disc, but could get the disc to, to slip out. If this angle is off of the angle of your spine, then your vertebrae are actually then twisting up and kind of making a wedge shape between the vertebrae, even allowing for even worse things to happen. And so the angle can be just as critical here as the amount. So let, let's see what I have here. So if I go tangent of theta, I would have the vertical piece. So what was the vertical piece over there? 2,517 out of the x component, which is 3214. And so now, putting that into my calculator, inverse tangent, uh, 2517 out of 3214, coming up at an angle of about 38 degrees. Now fortunately, and you can't see the picture, they do show the back angled, I believe, at 39 degrees. So this isn't too far off. And that could be fortunate for this individual in this particular case because even though the force is very large at least it's pushing in a preferred direction so that the the what we call it a shear force isn't so great and then you know separating the material in a what we call a shear direction instead of a compressional direction so this one this individual is not having a real trouble with shear but very easily could have a compressional issue. Or if the cartilage was strong enough, this individual could be having a problem with just a strain back, because this is big. So strain back, not good. Compressed discs, not good. <laughs> Slip disc, <laughs> not good either. And so these numbers all indicate what could go wrong by lifting a heavy object in a, what I'll call a not a wise way or something that you should only do if you're under 30. Okay, well with that said there was a bunch more examples I'd love to do but but I think now I should just start making you videos of the solution problems as you guys come across them. I've been talking a lot and we'll just call this a wrap for uh, this chapter and move on to more physics. All right, we'll see you next time. Bye now.